Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, and welcome to our Finca Impact Finance COVID-19 Client Impact Assessment Study webinar. Welcome to people all around the world who are joining us. My name is Seth Spiro. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Finca Impact Finance. Thank you for joining. Um, today, we're going to have an hour to talk about some of the results from a survey we've done of more than 8,000 of our customers across the world in Eurasia, Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. But before I start off, I just want to take a second to send our thoughts and best wishes to anybody who is currently struggling with this terrible virus, to their families, to their communities. Um, I don't want to start this webinar without just taking a moment to think about them and what they're going through right now and to send them all our collective best wishes. Today, we're going to go about an hour. We're using this Microsoft Teams tool that has a little bit of a delay. Um, so if you see things and then it's a few seconds later, just know that that's completely normal. There is a chat function with questions and we are going to try and get to every question that we can. So if you put your question in there, we will get to it near the end, about 40 minutes into it. And with that, I would like to introduce the folks that are going to be presenting and talking today. I'd like to start off with the president and CEO of Finca Impact Finance, Andre Simone. Hi, Andre. Hi. With her, we have Scott Graham, who is Director of Customer Research and Field Data Services at Finca International, who is the founder and uh, shareholder, majority shareholder of the Finca Impact Finance Network. Hi, Scott. Hey, Seth. And we have Anahit Tavosian, who is Director of Research and Client Impact for Fink International. Hello, Anahit. Hello, everyone. And we have Nathaniel Mayinde, who is dialing in from Kampala, and he is our Client Impact and Market Research Analyst for Africa. Hey, Nathaniel. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining, and let's get started. Um, we have a lot of folks that are on uh, the webinar who are maybe not familiar with Finca Impact Finance, so I'll do a very quick introduction. Um, Finca Impact Finance is a network that believes in the power of inclusive finance. We are a network of 20 banks and microfinance institutions around the world that deliver financial, uh, responsible financial services to low income customers. Today, we reach more than 2.6 million customers. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about what we do, I encourage you to follow us on Twitter at Finca Impact or join us, uh, visit us on the web at FincaImpact.com. We're going to cover a variety of issues today, all from our customers, from surveys that we've conducted about their concerns, about the business impact, about the outlook going forward for their businesses and what they are looking to Finca Impact Finance for, both in terms of repayment and the services they need to get back on their feet. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Andre Simone um, for a few welcoming remarks. Thanks, Seth. Um, so I won't spend much time, but I did want to welcome everyone today. Um, we are holding this webinar uh, a few months into this global pandemic and this economic crisis that's really uh, presenting a once in a lifetime challenge for our customers and the entire microfinance sector and of course the world. Um, and as of today, we've got some data, um, but really the final impact of COVID-19 uh, remains unknown. Like many of our peers in the microfinance space, um, Finca Impact really places a tremendous emphasis on the importance of listening um, to our staff and to our agents, but most importantly, perhaps um, to our clients um, and the end users um, who are really suffering terribly as a result of this pandemic. One of the things that, that differentiates um, Finca Impact um, from some other institutions is the great breadth of our operations, and Seth showed you the map, um, which is why today we can actually share the results of, of more than 8,000 customer surveys with you. Um, it, this is more than just nice to know information um, for all of us who are really interested in helping those who are um, financially marginalized uh, improve their standards of living. Uh, this is what we hope is uh, the beginning of a dialogue that can really help us to chart our course. So with that, I will hand it over to Scott. Thanks, Andre. <clears throat> uh, so I'll open with just a few remarks on the data set itself. And there are three things that I'd like our listeners to keep in mind uh, as we're going through these uh, indicators. 
The first is that um, that this is data that we collected ourselves using our own call center staff. Instead of outsourcing the data collection, which would have taken precious time and resources, we use this as an opportunity to really strengthen the organization's capacity to engage with its customers and to implement rigorous uh, research controls within the operating environment. And the main advantage of this at this moment is that it allowed us to get into the field very quickly and even start collecting data as early as March. Uh, and you'll you'll see that in the in the results. The second thing to keep in mind, and it might seem obvious, but it's important to mention is that the nearly 8,500 interviews that we're presenting here were from a representative sample of Finca's client base, um, whose incomes come from small and formal businesses and farming. So whether or not they're representative of the population at large in any given country, they're an extremely important segment to consider in the context of COVID not only because they are distant from social safety nets and vulnerable in so many ways, but also because we know from other research that these borrowers play a vital role in the sustenance of their families and in the grassroots economy. Um, finally, the last thing I would say is that um, this is not a one-time survey. It's actually an ongoing and expanding activity. Um, so we will have some kind of follow-up later in the year. Uh, we have partnered with the Social Performance Task Force and 60 Decibels to create a common survey framework um, that's presently being implemented in 23 countries, including many that are outside of the scope of today's analysis. And if you happen to be looking at the slide, um, I've marked in red uh, or in a red box, the countries that are um, also collecting data or whether uh, MFI is collecting data that are not in this current um, analysis. So with that, I'll just hand it over to um, Nathan to fill in a few details about the survey methodology itself, and then we'll get into the results. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. So uh, use of our own staff at the call center and the marketing teams, of course, allowed us to quickly start the process. Uh, we started with a qualitative phase, uh, open-ended conversations that enabled us to quickly to get client feedback and allow client to speak uh, openly with us. We used that to create quantitative survey instruments customized for each subsidiary, each country, and ended up uh, deploying the survey across 13 countries. More are still onboarding, of course, and with a sample of over 8,000 interviews done so far. Uh, the collected data is hosted on our Valley data platform. Uh, this has real-time data quality checks, which ensures timely identification of any problematic data points. And this enables us to move quickly to resolve any, any such problematic data points. And so any data that is output from this process is usually clean and ready for reporting. Thank you, Nathaniel. And let's get started. Uh, two quick things, we're recording this and we'll post it to our website. So if you have any connectivity issues, don't worry, it will be available. And we've chosen not to have videos on because of uh, wanting to be cognizant that people have different bandwidths across the world. And so by not using the videos, we hope that they can have a better quality sound and seeing the screens. We've organized this today more like a Q&A and not like a presentation. So we're going to have a back and forth with questions and answers and strongly encourage you all to um, put your questions into the chat. So let's get started. One of the things that makes COVID difficult to deal with is that the situation is constantly evolving. We went so quickly to a period of lockdowns and varying severities and durations, and now we're emerging into a different situation where businesses are at least allowed to open in some manner, but with some potentially long lasting and at least lingering damage to the economy and to the business climate. So Scott, in that context, how are people's overall view of the situation changing over time? And what could that mean for Finca? Thanks. So um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we were in the field already in March. And one thing that was very striking from the first wave of interviews was just how quickly the impact of COVID-19 was being felt in family consumption uh, with very little savings to tide them over, especially in Africa, clients immediately started reporting food security issues. Uh, in particular, they told us that they were shifting to less expensive food items 
and even roughly a third of customers were either reducing the number of meals or even going hungry. Uh, these kinds of responses literally came in within the first weeks of the lockdown, which was a real warning sign to us of just how serious um, the the situation was going was going to be. And uh, clearly, you know, people were in um, a very real struggle just to um, maintain a basic level of quality of life in their households. Um, and we even saw at that stage um, some differences between men and women, in particular uh, women bearing a greater responsibility for the uh, food consumption in their families were more likely to be reporting these kind of food security issues. Um, now, of course, food security was an immediate concern, but it's not the only issue. So to get a sense for the wider impact of COVID-19, we also ask clients about their overall level of concern. Um, if you could smooth, switch to the next slide. There you go, thanks. Um, overall concern, it sounds like a really broad indicator, but it actually tells us quite a lot. Um, it really speaks to how people, how personally, they feel the impact of COVID. Um, it's kind of an emotional barometer. And um, what's interesting is to see how it changes over time and how it varies by region. Um, uh, and uh, for that, I'll ask Anna Heat to uh, give us a bit of an explanation as to what we saw in the data, um, particularly through the different uh, periods and regions that we were conducting the survey. Thanks, Scott. So um, as of end of June, of all surveyed respondents, as we can see here, 73% mentioned they were very concerned about the COVID situation, in opposed to only 20% very concerned back in April when we first started the interviews. Well, in the beginning, the sentiments were different and our clients were expecting the situation will go back to normal pretty soon. But as it takes longer and our clients deplete the last drop of their savings and business capital plus economies remain stagnant health and care systems become more vulnerable with mounting number of cases all over the world we observe the upward trend in portion of very concerned well this was unexpected and none of our clients were prepared for such a long-lasting economic inactivity and um, as we see in the client's direct quotes, um, it's just unpredictable for them. They thought it would last a few weeks, but now they don't understand it anymore. Or they are facing very many challenges because they never planned for this. Yes, so people's uh, perspective about the situation is changing. Unknowns are increasing and we clearly see that in our data. Yeah, it's, I think it's a really striking trend, uh, especially considering that, um, you know, as dramatic as the first manifestations of COVID were in those early weeks of the lockdown, it still took a while for people's concern levels to really ratchet up. And in fact, a lot of the increase in concern has happened just in the last few months when, you know, life is supposedly kind of returning to something like normal, but clearly people are waking up to the fact that normal is not what they thought it was going to be. Um, and given, you know, our natural bias towards negative information, I'm guessing that it's gonna take a while for these concerns to wind down, um, even as the situation does eventually improve. So we may just be living with really high concern levels for a while at least. Yeah, and we also see some important and surprising variances by geography and gender. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to observe this big um, difference in the concern levels by region. And as you can see, the overall concern levels are the highest among our boroughs in Mesa and um, lowest in uh, Eurasia. Well, this might illustrate the different level of socioeconomic protection in this region, the greater economic resilience in one versus the other region. Um, some income, regional income differences of our client base, um, as well as government policy response levels of COVID. Uh, but now looking at the concern levels by gender, we see women are more concerned, which is not surprising, right? Many studies confirm that female take more burden from COVID impact. Uh, our female clients especially, um, they employ more vulnerable businesses with limited business capital that depletes pretty quickly. Um, and they are more prone to food security issues. Um, as, as, as already Scott mentioned in the previous slide, 
plus the increasing responsibilities related to child care, fam family care during these COVID times, reduce the already limited time that uh, they can devote to earning money. Thank you. So let's drill down a little bit. Uh, Scott mentioned that we have learned um, by asking clients about their overall concern, and those concerns actually are a composite of a lot of different kinds of worries, very specific kinds of worries. So Scott, let's drill down into those specific worries that we're hearing from our customers and how those worries are shaped by local or regional factors. Yeah, right. So I, I guess um, when we first started asking these questions, uh, it's worth mentioning that we phrased this as an open-ended question. Uh, so we weren't kind of giving people a list of things to choose from, but we simply asked them, you know, after, ask, after asking about their overall level of concern, what specifically was it that they were worried about? And we allowed that to really take shape spontaneously um, from open-ended responses, but it was very quickly apparent that there were some uh, just a handful of, of common um, common themes here. So the, the main categories include impact on business and income, general anxiety about the overall economy, uh, concerns about their own health and that of their loved ones, what to do with their children who are not in school, changes in social relationships and other challenges related to social distancing, and as we've already noted a few times, uh, even food security issues. So with that, I'll hand it over to Anahit to explain um, how these are evolving over time and what some of the differences we see between, uh, what are some of the differences we see between the regions? Yeah, so the most common COVID impact area that we see here identified by our clients is the business work. Uh, which uh, reaches its peak mid-May when 88% respondents identified this as primary concern area, then gradually reducing to 56% in late June as some restrictions were eased in countries. But starting from mid-June, concerns levels to health and overall economic situation acquire more importance, reaching from around 40% in April to almost 75% in late June. Now, uh, looking at regional differences, we see that um, impact on businesses is the biggest concern in Africa region, uh, showing greater vulnerability of the small informal business sector uh, to the pandemic in that region. Well, informal employment represents almost 90% of the total employment in low-income countries, as we know, and um, where not working or staying home means not only losing their jobs, but most importantly, their livelihoods. Um, since most of our clients cannot really rely on any income replacements, or big savings or significant business capital. And as we also saw from these direct quotes from our clients, if they don't work, they can't survive. And the reason being not the virus, but hunger. Yeah. So Anahi, um, it's Andre. Just quickly, you know, historically, um, our sector as a general rule um, and our clients have proven to be pretty resilient in the past as we've gone through major economic crises, and that's been one of the characteristics of microfinance. Um, what are you predicting in light of the trends that you're seeing now? Yeah, this is this is right, Andre. Uh, during 2008-9 uh, global recession, we saw economies with large informal sectors, especially African economies, performed much better than other developing countries because of various reasons. So there were high commodity prices which supported their export earnings, lower debts which provided the needed fiscal space, avoiding public you know, sector layoffs, etc. And the resiliency of the informal sector which continued to support the domestic economy, maintaining incomes and consumption for majority of households. Uh, well, in this situation, Africa will not be able to count on these mitigating factors this time, right? Commodity prices are not favorable, fiscal space is extremely limited, and informal sector is not in favorable position, uh, being hidden from government aids and business support packages, and bearing uh, the reduced demand that comes from mostly low-income vulnerable population. So, Anahid, um, I mean, I think that's a really 
a really interesting way to look at this, uh, you know, in terms of the formality and vulnerability of the businesses. But can you can you also break it down in terms of um, the sectoral activities? Because I think it's interesting to note that in Africa um, that the you know the direct business impact was so high considering that uh, so many of our customers are engaged in trade and services, while in places like Eurasia, um, our customers in particular have more diversified sources of income. Yeah, in fact, the se sectoral factors play a very large role, which uh, we see that uh, when we look at uh, specific ways that the business activities were impacted, so um, the severe downscale of economic activities to keep COVID-19 protocols are having very strong impact on informal, especially non-ag related businesses. Many of our clients own non-farm household businesses involving in retail trades such as like small kiosks for household consumables or farm inputs, small craft manufacturing or services such as hairdressing or small food courts. It's very, very important to note here that these businesses depend heavily on incomes of similar vulnerable households in the community that were hit by the lockdown the hardest. And majority of our clients in retail trade and service sector mentioned the lockdown and the reduced demand as main reasons for their business closure or reduction, as you can see. In retail trade, we also see our clients complain that people take the product of the service, but they're not able to pay. Given that these business owners have minimal business capital, no significant savings or other financial cushion, you know, most informal enterprises may have no choice but to use their negligible household assets or business capital for own consumption. And as a result, and as we see in our data, 50 to 70 percent of service and retail trade businesses were closed temporarily or permanently. Now, uh, farmers and ag related businesses didn't close and continued to work uh, within their farms and fields, at least to feed their families with their own harvest and livestock. But these businesses are recording other issues. Uh, for example, as you can see, such as transportation of perishable ag products, which puts a huge downward pressure on own prices. And this means that uh, they may not have the cash needed for the next season inputs and face financial issues during the next planting season. So, you know, the expectations are that the ag sector will still work and feed their families and communities with their minimum inputs, but the larger scale farming and ag activities might be under some risk. Thank you, Anahi. So let's focus a little bit more and think about what reopening looks like. Anahit, how do clients themselves, what are they saying? How do they envision the journey towards a more normal level of operations? So overall here again, uh, we see high uncertainties with around 50% of um, closed businesses are being unsure about the business re reopening timelines. And we do observe much lower uncertainties for ag sector businesses, right? As you can see. So with 60% restarting within a month or two, um, and uncertainties are highest in service and production um, sectors with more than 70% of the business owners using, um, you know, being just unsure about the reopening dates or estimate to open after three months and longer. So let's get to an issue that for better or for worse is probably top of everyone's mind, uh, which is around loan repayments. Um, before we get to the client perspective, Andre, could you give us a general picture of what's happening across the Finca Impact Finance portfolio? Yeah, thanks so much, Seth. Um, so, you know, uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we made the decision across the entire network um, that we were going to lower the levels of disbursements. Um, we wanted to preserve liquidity across the network. Um, as we were facing into the crisis uh, to understand exactly what the impact is going to be, but also um, to avoid over indebting customers um, who themselves might go into crisis. Um, we have gone back to um, a more limited profile of lending, but we're still down um, on in absolute terms uh, in terms of the gross loan portfolio about 12% since the beginning of the year. Um, we have, uh, like many of our peers in the industry, of course, um, been working with our clients uh, to restructure their loans. Um, we've actually restructured about 40% of the portfolio uh, to date. 
Um, it's very uneven across different countries um, because we've seen that those countries have been affected at different paces, um, in some cases by government mandates and in others just by um, the spread of the disease. Um, clearly, like many others, um, and I want to uh, acknowledge the fantastic work that CGAP has done working with the microfinance sector to collect information on portfolio quality and impact. Um, we have seen an erosion of the, the uh, portfolio quality across our network. Again, that's different in different countries. Um, and it's hard to see exactly yet what the long-term impact of that is going to be um, simply because we're still in the process of um, reopening in many, many places um, and even still facing renewed lockdowns in many places. Um, but hopefully as that data comes online, we'll have a, a better trend um, and be able to have a better grasp on where it's going to land. Thanks, Andre. Now, Scott, let's go back to the customer. What kind of data do we have that can put this into customer, into the intent context from the voices of our customers? Yeah, so first I'd just like to say how important it is to ask clients this question uh, because there's a lot of wide reaching decisions being made by regulators and lenders and donors uh, to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 that Andre was describing, uh, you know, exemplified in the CGAP initiative, for example. Um, and and of course, you know, coping with expected losses and restructuring are a really important part of that. But we really want to have the customer perspective, the borrower's perspective in mind. Uh, and I think that the data we're going to share really speaks to the good intentions and discipline of our borrowers who are struggling financially but want to meet their financial obligations. So for that purpose, we need to understand how confident the customers are in their ability to repay loans, understanding that um, you know confidence is really the client's own assessment of their ability to repay primarily, um, with probably you know some balancing in their mind between the different obligations and of course their household needs as well. Um, so to simplify the analysis, here we're really looking at just four categories of response. Uh, the first is people who are confident that they can definitely repay their loan either on time or with some delays, which of course are normal under the circumstances. Um, so we put uh, we put those together. Um, the second category is made up of people who consider that they can probably repay their loans again uh, with most likely with some delays. Um, the difference between definitely and probably uh, doesn't need a lot of explanation, but it is a really important one uh, because it speaks again to people's um, level of confidence. And um, then we have people who are simply pessimistic that they'll be able to repay it all. And uh, another group of people who are just too unsure to even hazard a guess. Um, these sentiments are obviously not static as people are assimilating new information and adapting to a changing situation, um, just like the overall concerns about COVID-19. So um, now I hand it back over to Anna Heat to explain how this is evolving uh, over the last several months. Thanks, Scott. So um, as the economy continues um, to remain, you know, more or less stagnant uh, with an upward COVID cases in many countries, um, we see the portion of respondents choosing probably versus definitely gradually increases, right? So if in April more than 40% clients were definite about their repayment intentions, now we see almost 50% are indefinite. Uh, the possible economic reason behind this is first of all expectations. And as uh, we mentioned in the beginning, our clients were expecting this, actually they were not expecting this situation um, and the economic stagnation lasts this long. So they um, were having some positive expectations about their business outlook and repayment ability. But as the situation remains basically the same and even deteriorates uh, in some cases, and the unpredictability continues to upsurge with lots of unknowns from all directions, we see the direct mirroring in our data with the increasing portion of respondents choosing probable rather than definite answers. And um, 
it's also really striking to see some of the differences when we compare between regions uh, and in particular I am thinking about um, the difference between Africa and Eurasia makes for such an interesting contrast. Uh, in Africa, we can see that the overall levels of concern, well, going back to the earlier part of the of the presentation, you know, when we saw that the overall levels of concern were, were, were the highest in Africa, um, and so we might expect that the repayment outlook would be the most pessimistic, and yet by this metric, uh, they're actually the most optimistic about repaying their loans. And then the exact opposite is true in Eurasia, where the overall concern levels that we saw earlier were the lowest, but the expectations of repayment are also quite low. And we would expect these two things to be inverted. Um, that is, we would expect lower levels of expected loan repayment in Africa and higher levels in Eurasia. So, Anahi, why do you think we're seeing the opposite? Yeah, this is a great question, Scott. So we see different reasons underneath of this trend, right? Uh, one factor can, of course, be the difference in the government support policy packages and the way they are being announced and available in each country or region. In general, we see our clients in Eurasia, for example, being more aware of economic relief packages and repayment holidays than in Africa. But, uh, and most importantly, from our own data, we see that economically more vulnerable have better habits in paying their bills and obligations on time, um, saving for emergencies, for example, accumulating some assets for unexpected times, and um, cutting from their food but paying their obligations. That's what we see from our data. So, you know, we definitely see that picture here with some informal, smaller and much more vulnerable client base in Africa region is more disciplined and um, sure of their payment intentions. Now, um, for gender differences that we observe here, uh, there can be, of course, some natural variances in the way females respond to questions like being more cautious, deliberate or careful, um, using probable language more than definite language. However, what we see in the data is pretty real, right? So showing that concern sentiments are higher in female client responses and the clients are more exposed to food security issues and overall negative impact of COVID, which is not surprising as they are in more vulnerable seasonal businesses, our female clients are, and they carry the additional load of childcare, family care during these COVID times which really limits the time female can devote to earning money to pay their um, their debts. Thank you, Anahit. There's quite a few questions coming in, and I just want to let everyone know that we will try and get to those questions in just a few minutes as we um, wrap up our last three uh, slides. So finally, let's look at what people are looking for from Finca, the client expectations. So the relationship with our customers is, is clearly more than transactional. People want someone on their side. They want a reliable partner, especially as they face this uncertainty. So my question for you, Anahit, is what are the customers telling us about how we can help them the most at this moment? Well, um, Seth, we see that our clients want to have much more than regular functions of financial organizations, that's for sure. Uh, of course, their loan restructuring being their top ask, but uh, they started to inquire support of various dimensions. Like you can see many clients these days struggle to rethink the way they should do their business during these unprecedented times. And um, the normal is going to be new for everyone. And they understand this very well, right? Uh, but how their business strategy should respond to all of those changes in an area that they mostly seek advice on. And not only the way they adjust their businesses, but also they want advice, they search for an advice about their new lives. <laughs> Plus, uh, since we work with more vulnerable who are prone to food security, uh, many of our clients also um, ask for direct food and other necessity aids. Uh, also, being in um, informal sector is another factor that hinders them to receive government aids. So um, they see Finca as someone who can provide that immediate help to them and their families. Um, so yeah, we observe these interesting developments here with our clients giving their financial institutions some direct hints of what the successful cooperation would look like 
with us being supporter of their businesses so that they can become good and responsible clients for us. Now, the biggest issue being the loan restructuring. Nathaniel, what did you hear about this in the qualitative data? Yeah, we got very good feedback in the qualitative data, mostly related to restructuring of the existing loans. And uh, uh, client feedback uh, talks about dividing loans into smaller installments so that they are manageable to repay, uh, granting grace periods. And interestingly, uh, we got feedback that uh, there should be no interest charged during this lockdown period and any penalties or fines in cash because of non-payment should uh, be removed. Uh, there was also uh, the point of getting new loans, uh, maybe lower interest rates or increasing the loan terms. Uh, but uh, related, relating to the issue of interest and penalties, it was said if those are charged, then they should be refunded. Like the refund, the charges, the interest and penalties that would have been incurred during this uh, lockdown period. So Nathaniel, I think there's something really powerful in that, um, you know, the clients don't are don't want to be the ones holding the bag, you know, and I think they're aware that, uh, you know, they often are the ones who pay the ultimate price. Um, and so it's just very interesting to me to see that uh, so many of the responses as it relates to restructuring their obligations really point to an awareness that, you know, they don't want to be the only ones who have to, um, you know, who have to bear the the cost of that lockdown. Um, and so this is really a call, I think, for some shared sacrifice and for um, collaboration. And, and I think that it's something that we should be very willing to give when we consider um, how intent people are about repaying their loans, particularly in Africa, where as Anna Heat pointed out, um, you know, clients are, you know, closest to you know the border between survival and not surviving and yet you know that's where people um have the the clearest um you know most optimistic expectations of repayment and so i think that there's um they're really asking us to be their partners especially also considering um some of the other kinds of new support that they're looking for that anna heat mentioned so um i think that brings us to the end of our um, kind of prepared uh, remarks here. I'll just close out by mentioning that, um, th or I guess repeating that this is not a one-time activity. We are in fact going to be doing another round of surveys in the next couple of months, um, and we're going to be adding some financial health and financial management questions to the survey. Um, so that's going to give us, I think, a really interesting uh, perspective on how clients are adapting their financial strategies uh, to whatever this new normal ends up being. Um, we're also intending to ask some PPI questions so we'll be able to see um, what some of the differences are in terms of uh, different income levels in the households. So um, that's a bit of a plug for the next webinar. Uh, and with that, I will um, hand it over to Seth to moderate the Q&A. Thanks, Scott. I want to just take a second to thank some of the Finca Impact Finance staff members in our marketing, our research team. Um, doing 8,000 customer interviews is a challenge and they all took it and ran with it. And so I do want to sincerely thank those folks that helped um, collect this information um, that was presented to you today. Um, thank you all for joining. There are quite a few questions and we're going to get to as many as we can. So why don't we just start? Um, first, this is a good question for Scott Nanahid and Nathaniel. Can you give some info on the survey structure? How long were you able to keep respondents on the phone? After 8,000 interviews, what would you say is the maximum time to expect them to stay engaged in an interview? Um, you know, I would, I, would, I would pass it over to Nathaniel since he was the one uh, managing the field work. Yeah, <clears throat> I would say the maximum uh, time we have spent on our phone with a client uh, respondent is about 15 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> the minimum is about uh, seven minutes, so uh, a toss up between seven to 15, but 15 is a bit, a little bit pushing it. On average, you would like an interview <clears throat> of about uh, eight to 10 minutes at most. And uh, if I could just um, also mention here, because this was something that we really noted 
uh, in especially in the early stages of the survey was that clients are actually really eager to share this information with us. This is not a situation where, you know, people are feeling put upon when their financial institution calls them with, you know, an earnest uh you know inquiry into the well-being of their households i think actually um that this is something that from the customer experience perspective can really be you know it conveys empathy it can it conveys you know a real uh interest in their well-being and you know i think as long as we can stick within the parameters that nathaniel mentioned um that we should you know we should expect um people to continue to be really collaborative in collecting this kind of data and uh, thanks scott and another question around the survey given your experience what's the minimum sample size for clients interviewed by client segment for example, if you want feedback from women farmers who are under 50 and you ask five people in that segment or 10 people or 30, what's the minimum you would look for? Or just in general, the sample size? Yeah, I think I will hand that one to Anna Heat, who is our methodology regulator. Yeah, this is this is a great question to what I may not have a concrete answer because I don't know the specifics of the sample universe and uh, sampling technique that they're, they they want to use number of stratum etc um, i think it's uh, it's hard for me to give a concrete you know number but i would just mention the larger the sample size the smaller the margins of error and after a point of course increasing the sample size beyond what you already have provides you diminished returns because uh, because of the increased accuracy will be negligible so but again um I, I i i can't really provide any concrete answer to that unless i i know the specifics so anahit maybe if i could uh just phrase the question more specifically in the context of our survey so when we were sampling for our subsidiaries we were not trying to stratify between different segments we were trying to capture the entire client universe so are there any kind of like rules of thumb that we followed in terms of you know reaching a good representation of the overall sample yeah so if we don't stratify scott uh, 350 to 450 is is the you know range that we work with um if there is no stratification there is no clustering um you know this is not a panel study um yeah the, the simple the simple answer with the, will be that but as, as i as i see here you know um there is this um segments that they're interested in but i I can't right. really give any advice if I don't know the specifics of the sample universe and the uh, way they want to um, uh, sample. Understood. I'll direct a question towards Andre. I'm trying to group some of the questions. Some of them are a bit similar. So what is Finca's par 30 over the last and how has it changed over the last four months? Could you just give a, a general overview of our portfolio at risk and what you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, for people who are interested in the PAR 30 trends, I do encourage you guys to go to the um, the CGAP Pulse survey data, which is also publicly available and will give you an idea of institutions um, by size and country and geography. Um, but we are global PAR 30 across the entire network um, as of just a few days ago stands at 14 percent. Um, that is obviously very different across regions. Um, uh, as you might expect, it's lower in Eurasia and Mesa and higher in Latin America and Africa. Um, I, I think, though, it's really important to note we, we have seen it declining. So obviously, early on in the pandemic, we didn't see a lot of impact um, uh, as the economic impacts of lockdowns um, and also just the spread of the virus started to really affect people. Um, we saw that spike up pretty significantly and then come down again. But um, I think it's important to acknowledge the shortcomings of PAR 30 as a metric, um, particularly in light of um, the massive restructuring that's taking place across the sector. Um, so we are actually actively um, working to track restructured loan portfolio um, as well as uh, PAR 30 and the quality of both of those, and, sorry, PAR 30 in the general portfolio and PAR 30 in the restructured portfolio. Um, to really make sure that we're managing that carefully. And 
my expectation certainly um, across the entire sector um, is that it's going to take a bit more data for that to, to really shake out and see um, what the longer term impact is because there are still um, significant delays in people's ability to repay just from the physical aspects of the lockdowns. Um, so keep stay tuned uh, to that. Um, but clearly, you know, people's ability to repay has been significantly affected. And I have another question that I think is a wonderful question and one that we actually talk about quite a bit internally at Finca, which is how can we use this data for decision making across Finca? Or do we have examples already where we're using this as um, uh, using the findings for decision making? A wonderful question, whoever asked that. Yeah, so maybe I'll take that, Scott. Um, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, look, for us, um, having access to this information is hugely helpful um, because it, it confirms things that we thought we knew or disabuses us of, of the ideas that we had. Um, clearly, from a sectoral perspective, um, it validates that the agricultural sectors are more resilient and that economies where people have more diversified sources of income um, tend to be more resilient and, and, and more confident about um, what the future holds. And so that helps us then to advise our clients who are struggling around um, you know, what segments uh, are likely to, to be the most resilient for them as well. Um, and informs you know, how we collaborate with the different sectors in terms of restructuring, um, knowing going into it that we're going to have to be more lenient um, with, with some segments than others. And, and Andre, if I could just underline a couple of the points you made there, because I think that there's, I think there's a very widespread misconception among people about what research is supposed to do. I think that, you know, we all, sort of think about those like, you know, golden nuggets of insight that somehow radically, you know, set us off in a new direction. You know, that's great when it happens, but a lot of what we're trying to do here is also just understand the context that we're operating in. And, um, you know, a lot of those connections are not necessarily going to be explicit, but they're going to be part of a deeper understanding of our clients and the situation that they're that they're navigating and so i think that's one very important thing to keep in mind and the other is that um a big part of management's challenge these days and i think andre has spoken to these you know quite quite clearly uh this morning is uh you know setting expectations knowing you know uh for you know for understanding what is reasonable to look for from ourselves and from our clients in terms of things like loan repayment. And so to the extent that we can set those expectations and have the client's perspective, you know, at the table when all of this is when all when these decisions are being made, I think it just, you know, it enriches and improves the decision making more generally. And, you know, when there are very specific insights, like, for example, you know, the um, the the importance of agriculture um then you know then of course those are those are incredibly helpful but i think limiting ourselves to to those kinds of um you know direct actions in a way really makes us lose sight of what the whole effort is about thank you scott thank you andre i'm going to go back a little bit so some of these are in references to some of the specific slides one of the questions was, might the replies on likelihood of repayment be cultural in terms of how people repay, in terms of respect, candor, et cetera? Uh, I'm sure the answer to that is yes, but I will let Anahit uh, chime in more specifically. Yeah, I think that's what we mentioned, and we see that very clearly, right? Uh, you know, that um, uh, the differences exist and um, there are some also cultural aspects where we saw African subsidiaries, uh, people in Africa are more ready to cut from their food but pay, uh, while, um, you know, uh, our clients in Eurasia, maybe because of some of the support packages, government support packages and the awareness of the public in general, they are more laid back. Thank you, Anahit. Another question, I think this one more for Andre. Um, the aggregate of agreed grace periods on loan repayments will have significant impact on cash flow into the MFI treasury function. Are there funds available for emergency wholesale MFI funding so that operations can be sustained? 
So I am aware um, that there are efforts being made to put those funds together um, and in various countries um, there are funds being made available uh, to MFIs um, at discounted rates uh, to support lending and, and um, we're certainly um, delighted to see various governments stepping in. I think the reality is that um, across the globe, everyone is still trying to assess um, what the impact is going to be. Um, and so we're at that data collection point in time. Um, again, I'll, I'll point back to the, the global efforts being made um, to identify that. There's been a lot of collaboration across the industry um, uh, with the, the global level lenders and the regulators um, and uh, institutions like the World Bank and CGAP um, to collect that information, to share what we're seeing um, and to begin to identify solutions um, because clearly there will be support that's needed um, as we move into the future. Thanks, Andre. A comment from Daniel. Interesting that Eurasia clients seem to be expecting more government support or at least less pressure to service their obligations. Lower income countries may have more long term need to keep in good relationship with the lenders with their lenders. And let's see here. Julie asked, how often should MFIs do these surveys? Well, for the sake of Finca, uh, we, we do surveys on an ongoing basis, so we are always in contact with our clients to get feedback. Uh, and I think uh, the more in touch you are with your clients, the better understanding you generate on both sides. OK, so now we have a question from um, Devish. Can restructuring backfire in terms of borrowers becoming complacent? Um, and as a follow-up question, in case of existing bar uh, existing borrowers need help to repay and they seek help from local unorganized money lenders who charge exorbitant interest rates, can they get into a debt trap? I'm going to assume that's to me, Scott. Um, it, yeah, so I, I will certainly take that. Um, uh, I think that um, part of the reason that we need to be very careful about restructuring um, is to uh, avoid that potential risk. Um, we have not seen that to date, um, as, as Scott and Anahi rightly pointed out in the data, um, you know, microfinance clients tend to have close relationships with the institutions that they work with um, and the desire to repay um, remains strong. But obviously, um, you know, it's part of the reason that we are diving into the data um, to try and determine what the sentiment is in the marketplace. Um, we need to be sensitive to the needs of our clients. Um, we need to restructure in ways that really um, support them uh, to meet their obligations um, uh, and, and be able to, to deliver on that. Um, I think that in terms of the, the money lender side, um, you know, obviously we, we as an industry are here because we want to help people improve their financial health and certainly do not um, want them to have to fall into debt traps. And um, that's something that we've been working very hard to avoid. Um, uh, I haven't seen any data to that effect yet, um, but that's something that we'll need to pay attention to. And uh, I would just add that I think this is some uh, something that we can explore a bit in the next round of surveys, you know, because we can, um, you know, we can sample from, you know, people whose loans have been restructured in different de to different degrees to see if there are, you know, any differences in terms of like their financial health or their, um, you know, their ability to manage their obligations, for example. Thanks, Scott. Uh, we've got a question from Chris. Have you formed some learnings on identifying and overcoming potential bias and mitigating risk that respondents don't understand the value of the survey or are intimidated or embarrassed to provide accurate responses? Have you explored deploying digital versions of the survey? Um, we sp we have not actually. I think that um, the the nature of the situation that people are in at the moment uh, really lends itself to a uh, more human kind of touch. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, Nathaniel, who's been more on the front lines of the data collection, can can kind of talk about the tenor of those conversations. But 
I don't think that those have actually really been uh, affected by, you know, uh, embarrassment uh, or people not wanting to open up. I think actually it's been kind of the reverse, um, at least in this situation. But uh, let me ask and Nathaniel and Annie Heaton, if you guys are seeing something different than what I just said, please, uh, please share it. Well, <clears throat> there is a definite appreciation. Uh, uh, especially in the interview process, as you start discussing with a, a client, there is this appreciation that Finka is reaching out and trying to understand my life, uh, and 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 trying to figure out together with me ways on how how we can work together uh, throughout this pandemic. So we, we we got that kind of feedback very frequently uh, over qualitative nature, especially. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, I will I will defer to Anna hit on the next part of the question in in terms of uh, overcoming potential bias and uh, and mit mitigating uh, these risks, which which I think uh, we have done very well to to mitigate. Uh, yeah, I think the way we structured the uh, survey questions, even from the beginning, I went the way we engage with the clients is very friendly. The tone of the interview in general. So, you know, we don't really uh, and our call centers are are, are just great, uh, you know, uh, very, very professional in this because they are in contact with clients all the time. And this is not being as only survey. So we contact uh, we're in contact with our clients in many different ways with many different surveys. Uh, you know, in this very specific case, uh, as Scott mentioned and Nathaniel confirmed, human touch is very important for them now. And um, especially Finger reaching out and trying to learn their struggles, their needs, etc. They're very open. Um, so at this moment, I wouldn't um, see any risk of potential bias in responses. Uh, well, we do have uh, the data that we collect is via our valid data platform. The platform. Uh, employs uh, artificial intelligence to understand the potential behavioral biases in the data and highlights those via um, two um, you know specific uh, machines uh, uh, and and we're able to actually uh, in real time track the quality of the data and any behavioral uh, biases that we might expect. Uh, but I would say that um, this survey is 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 uh, doing much better in this sense because people are ready. People are ready to provide their deeper feedback. People are ready to talk more about their struggles, um, and yeah, they're they're more open. Thanks, Anahit. There's a question here. I don't know that we are all in a position to answer, but maybe from Steve. Do any of our countries provide assistance to our our sector of clients in terms of economic assistance? Be it food relief or actual financial support? Yeah, there are various efforts um, in in different countries. Um, Steve, I apologize that I, I don't have the specific list in front of me, but you know, for example, um, I know that in several of the African um, subsidiaries, uh, there are efforts underway from the governments to provide uh, food assistance and, and financial support. Um, and I think that that kind of touches on an important issue that Anahit mentioned earlier, which is um, the capacity of governments to address these issues right now is, is much more limited than it's been in past crises. Um, and, and so um, that's a concern point that everybody should have in their heads around, um, you know, what kind of financial assistance can we um, expect to be made available to clients who um, are obviously suffering food shortages in addition to uncertainty and health concerns. Thanks, Andre. Um, there were some questions I think that came earlier that we weren't able to get to of the 25 questions that came. So what I would like to offer is that if there was a question that you asked or maybe one that comes up later as you think about what you've heard over the last hour and you feel like you want to ask it, email info at thinkitimpact.com and we'll get you an answer. Unfortunately, there was quite a few questions that we couldn't get to in this short hour. But with that, I do want to thank everyone for joining. I especially want to thank Nathaniel, Anahit, Scott and Andre um, for all the efforts that went into this. Um, this has been a, a long time coming in terms of us planning for it, and I sincerely appreciate them and all the folks that administered the survey on the ground in our 20 countries. And with that, 
thank you all for coming. I hope you all have a great rest of the week and a good weekend. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Mm.